Jeff Delby. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm the president here at the board of our little history center. Um, we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the next year or two. So um, without further ado, we'll just move it along. Uh, we're going to have the treasurer's report from Diana Edwards of Murphy Edwards Gonzalez Ferrara. And when she's ready. Oh, I have to call the meeting to order. <laughs> Calling the meeting to order now. It's official. All right, now that we have an official meeting, I think we're all ready to go. I wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight, and I also wanted to thank very much all of our donors, our sponsors, and all of our volunteers that make all this possible. Our wonderful exhibits and our programs and our house tour and everything else doesn't happen at all without all of you. So again, we thank you so very much. We actually have a little bit of a bounce back year from last year. We had a little bit of a deficit last year, but uh, this year came on pretty strong. Our donors really helped us out. It was great. And we also had a very good investment year. I think the uh, market was down at the end of uh, 15. And it came back up at the end of 16. So actually, it was a $25,000 swing on the investments, which was very helpful, even more so now. <laughs> so and we also had the Village Hall uh, had a very good year. And I also wanted to thank also the uh, Friends of the Village Hall Committee for helping us tremendously also with the town. Hi, everyone. Uh, a lot of this is in your program already, but believe it or not, that is the abridged edition. <laughs> um, so um, 2016 was a very busy year for our collections, and it has been a really incredible year of discovery for me. Uh, spending time with our collections has opened my eyes to the richness of Framingham's history and the people who live in this community. Uh, and I'm developing connections with the community in ways that I certainly could not have imagined when I started this job one year ago. It is impossible to report on everything we've done in the last year because it has been a whirlwind. Uh, but here are some highlights. The inventory of our textile collections that we began last February continues. Uh, since Catherine Conwalker uh, began her work over a year ago, she has inventoried over uh, nearly 1,000 items. Uh, <laughs> that includes dresses, bodices, skirts, children's clothing, uniforms, shoes, hats, parasols, fans, and various other accessories. Uh, as she's been doing her work, we have also begun the difficult process of letting collections pieces that are in poor condition go. Uh, as well as items that have no clear provenance or connection to Framingham's history. So far, we have deaccessioned 172 items and will continue to review pieces for condition and provenance as we look to downsize what had become an unmanageable collection. Reducing the size of this collection, though, uh, has really allowed us to make significant improvements to our storage space upstairs. Uh, we have newly installed modular shelving, which allowed us to move many pieces into proper hanging and box storage and more improvements are planned for the following year, um, <clears throat> including better space for handling collections and for rolled storage for our flat textiles. We have a lot more space to maintain our undamaged items now, uh, as well as those more fragile items that tell really important Framingham stories. Although we are reducing in some areas, our collection continues to grow in others. Uh, in 2016, more than 60 gifts, including individual items and groups of items, came in from donors all over the country. While most came from Framingham or other Metro West areas, uh, we have received donations from much further afield as well, including Houston, Texas, Greensboro, North Carolina. We've gotten some from Vermont. And actually, we recently got something from uh, my hometown in New Jersey, which was a very unusual thing. I didn't expect that to come in. <laughs> um, we are extremely grateful to all of our collections donors uh, who, no matter where they are from, care about Framingham history. Some of the more remarkable pieces that we got this past year were a Purple Heart awarded to a Framingham soldier who was lost during World War I, along with the commendations signed by Franklin Roosevelt, uh, two class rings from a married couple who attended rival Framingham high schools, uh, and a time capsule that used to be housed in the cornerstone of the Old Grace Church before it burned down. In just one short year, we have launched two new exhibits. First was my inaugural exhibit right behind me, a History in the Stitches, Framingham Fashion Through the Centuries. 
To mount that exhibit, we did extensive conservation work on two gowns and made repairs and added support to nearly every other gown on display, as well as several gowns upstairs, which did not make it to display. And this was with the help of two dedicated volunteer seamstresses, uh, Barbara, Barbara Gatlin and her sister Eloise Shapner. I actually am not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, <clears throat> this is only a small drop in the bucket uh, for our conservation needs. There are still many incredible pieces of clothing that we can use to tell the stories of Framingham men and women that need extensive stabilization before we can use them to really tell this story to the rest of the community. We also dedicated our permanent Civil War exhibit this past April. This exhibit was a long time in the making, and without the motivation of um, our program and development coordinator and our resident Civil War buff, Jennifer Tote, might have been even longer in the making. Um, so we are proud to say that a beautiful exhibit about Framingham's role in the Civil War is now going to be permanently honored here in Framingham's first Civil War Memorial Building. It's especially fitting that it should be housed in the Gordon Alcove, an extension of the library funded by Civil War Gor Gen General George Gordon's wife, Lizzie, in his honor. Sadly, we will this year be losing the centerpiece of our exhibit, the eagle and alligator ornament taken by General Gordon from the, just, from the desk of Jefferson Davis at the end of this month. Um, and you may actually, if you go back there, notice that its case is now empty because we have packed it up. The Mass Historical Society is recalling their loan. Unfortunately, it is not ours to keep. Uh, and I have been told that the curator there does have great plans for it. So we will make sure to let our membership know when it will be possible to view the, this incredible piece of history at the Mass Historical Society headquarters in Boston, which hopefully will be soon. Uh, finally, we made some changes to our permanent exhibit at the Old Academy, spurred by our incoming class of Framingham third graders. Our 20th century exhibit has been completely reorganized with a new suffragette proudly on display, along with a small exhibit about Framingham's Lady Edison, Margaret Knight. Maintaining these collections and mounting these exhibits is a collaborative process, and I want to thank the rest of the staff as well as all of the volunteers who dedicate so much of their time to helping me maintain these incredible collections. And I can't wait to see what we accomplish this year. <laughs> Hello, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Annie Murphy and I'm executive director of the History Center. And um, last night I went to a nonprofit workshop where different foundation officers discussed a new focus around future grant making that they felt we should all understand. The message was be bold articulate how we are adopting bold initiatives in support of our missions. After a while, the talk emboldened me to write down some of the ways that the History Center is already being quite bold. In 2016, our board adopted a collections manifesto that boldly articulates the need to strengthen our collections by deaccessing items which do not support our mission. The manifesto is on our website if you would like to read it. It's actually quite important um, for you all to understand the, the need to do this to, so that we can manage our collections. If they're too large, they're unmanageable. And we have made major discoveries as a result of this. Um, the process of deaccessioning items is extremely complicated and Stason is bravely implementing this manifesto with the support of our board. Laura Stagliola in the back, our education coordinator and museum assistant, has boldly taken on Facebook, Twitter, website, and all things digital. She is digging deeply into Framingham history and her regular posts are averaging a reach of 1,000 people apiece. Her post on Shopper's World and Joan and Ed's Deli reached 4,440 people and that's without a paid boost. How many of you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? If you do, please um, share it, share our posts and that will drive up our followers exponentially. I can assure you, this kind of following is not normal among local or even statewide history organizations. Our program and membership coordinator, Jennifer Tote, was behind the production of 17 programs and events last year. As part of our Civil War permanent exhibit opening, she pulled together a group of actors 
and a producer, David O'Leary. And we now have a general Gordon walking tour on our new Framingham History Center app. Go forth into the digital world, we are doing it. The cards on your seat tell you how to download this app and take this tour. When I heard the narrator's voice for the first time, it literally gave me goosebumps. It's like we had our own, we have our own Ken Burns moment. It really is good, and I, I urge you to um, download that thing. And then during the summer of 2016, the Friends of the Village Hall group was born over coffee at Panera Bread with Betty Funk, Helen Lemoyne, and myself. I suggested it would be a good idea if Bert Marmer was asked to join this group as well. Talk about being bold. They, along with Charlie Sisiski, Fred Wallace, and David Hornfisher, became dogged advocates for the Village Hall and its need for handicapped access, something that we, I have been working towards since I have been here for 12 years. Um, for months, they spoke at community meetings, they met with individual acquaintances, town employees, and behind the scenes at town meeting, and they succeeded. Yay. Town meeting voted to fund. Oh. Emotional. <laughs> oh dear. $2.45 million in accessibility improvements and fire suppression. I truly believe that they saved this historic monument to town government from demolition by neglect. Um, in closing, uh, this is going to be really difficult <laughs> because we are um, recognizing three of our current board members who will be moving off the board this year. Our governance committee recommended instituting term limits for the health of our board, and as painful as it is to see these longtime members move on, it is good gov governance. Lou Colton, Lou, where are you? Lou has been lending his architectural expertise and concern for our collection since 2009. My strongest memory of working with Lou was calling him up in a panic because I was putting together a proposal to the Mass Historical Commission that dealt with repointing and repairing the exterior of this building. And I just didn't have the language down. And Lou met me at Kugel's. And we worked and worked with me for hours on how to get this right, and I made the deadline and we got the grant. <laughs> Lou also gave the History Center many hours of his time in the early days of our work around des designing accessibility at the Village Hall. As I said, we've been working on this for a long time. He is often a lone voice on the board's deaccession votes. And he keeps us all honest in this regard. While I would have liked to have given him something we recently deaccessed, it is against the protocol. So instead, I thought he would like this item, which someone donated to the tag sale instead. <laughs> and I, I'm looking for this item. Where is it? Oh, is it in? No, it's not in the envelope. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Drum roll. Okay, this is a nail. <laughs> and he already loves it. He's an architect builder. Anyway, it has a note on it saying that this nail belonged to Abigail Adams. And it has a connection to the Hemingways and the Lewises, and you're going to love this little connection. So this is, this is for you, Lou. <laughs> I, I, it's yours. No, it was never in the collection. Okay, so I can give it to you. If it were in the collection, I couldn't have done that. Talk to Stacey. Okay. Okay, so Andrea Haynes, Andrea. Andrea has served three, 
two three-year terms on our board, and she brings a quiet and discerning presence to our meetings. She follows the issues closely and adds her wise input. She brought her extensive experience with a number of town organizations to our board. As a writer and editor, she doesn't miss a trick. If there's an email, e-news, or some other missive with an incorrect date or time, she lets me know right away, and that is really very helpful. And Andrea probably gets the award for attending the most programs of any board member, and I can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Thank you, Andrea. We're going to be giving you some little presents and some uh, certificates of appreciation after I finish. The, um, last, the last but not least is Helen Lemoyne. Um, <sighs> <laughs> Ooh, Helen and I joined the board together in 2003. And she's been with us ever since. I cannot express how much she has done for this organization over the past 14 years, six of which she served as board president. And guess what? She's the head of the governance committee. <laughs> and so she's the one that made us institute these uh, term limits. She, I wonder why. So since becoming the executive director 12 years ago, she's been by my side every inch of the way as a leadership mentor, trusted advisor, donor, and wonderful friend. If you came to one of our Pass Forward coffees between 2011 and 2014, you might remember Helen starting one of these tours with her story of how she fell in love with the Framingham History Center. I think you really did use those words. <laughs> I've estimated that she told this story at least 60 times, and, <laughs> and I can imagine she could tell it in her sleep. These coffees were a key component in a program that strengthened the financial capacity of this organization, and she was involved in every facet of its success. Helen is one of Framingham's greatest treasures, and aren't we lucky that she really loves history? <laughs> Um, I could go on, but we have a wonderful speaker, so I won't. But thank you, Helen. So will you three come up and... Helen, this is for you. And a little Renew gift certificate. <laughs> Your favorite store. Oh, yeah. wait a minute, let me give it, let, let's That's give all of the things. Okay, blue, this, your nail, and wait a second, and then one more little item for you. Okay, and Andrea, here we go. Thank you, and these, these, uh, oh, my goodness. you know, for your gardening. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Everyone, you want to flex around with the you? Lou, you too. Oh, but don't worry about it. All right, we don't want to be Volunteer of the Year Award. I won't cry on this one, I promise. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I promise his promises, right? <laughs> okay, I had to look back in my emails to find out when Ruth Ann Tomasini, where are you, Ruth Ann? Are you right there? Began working as a research volunteer here. The earliest one I could find was July 11, 2013, and in true to Ruth Ann form, she answered my forwarded research inquiry with handled. <laughs> I was like, just done it. Um, she comes in every Thursday, and she and Fred Wallace work at the library at the academy from 10 to 2, and then, then some. 
And then she also comes in often on appointments, uh, by appointment only on other days as well. It is so great to be able to forward the numerous email inquiries I received to Fred and Ruth Ann and know that they will most happily respond. Given that Ruth Ann was born and raised in Framingham, she really enjoys the 20th century inquiries because maybe because she's related to everybody. Um, <laughs> She is also a great resource as we prepare for our house tours, and this year her research on the Italianate mansion with the homeowner resulted in a fabulous PowerPoint which we watched at the patrons party and the tour itself. She's also been a great help to Katie and Stason as they work to piece together the provenance on so many of the items that we're processing. Sometimes Ruth Ann does such a great job that she ends up doing a family's genealogy. She will say to me, you know, one thing leads to another. <laughs> one of those projects led to a sizable donation to the History Center in her honor. So Ruth Ann, we are so fortunate to have you working with us and we wanted to recognize your contributions with this Volunteer of the Year Award. Having concluded our official business for tonight, I will entertain a motion to close the annual meeting of 2017. So moved. Is there a second? second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? So voted. And now I get to introduce our featured speaker for this evening. Um, J.L. Bell is the proprietor of the Boston 1775 website, which offers daily helpings of history, analysis, and unabashed gossip about the Revolutionary War in New England. Last year, he published the book, The Road to Concord, How Four Stolen Cannon Ignited the Revolutionary War. He is also the author of a large study for the National Park Service about General George Washington's work in Massachusetts in the first year of the war. John is now working on a book about how Washington re-engineered his artillery force with the help of Henry Knox, and tonight he'll share some of that new research with us. And I just want to say that after the talk, not only will we have wine and cheese, but John will be signing books in my office if you'd like to purchase them. Thank you so much, John. My starting point is a quotation from this man, John Adams. On January 25th, 1776, he was traveling back to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and he wrote in his diary, about 10, Mr. Gary, that's Elbridge Gary, another delegate to the Congress, called me, and we rode to Framingham, and we dined. After midday dinner, a wealthy local farmer showed Adams and Gary the train of artillery brought down from Ticonderoga by Colonel Knox. Adams went on to list exactly what was in the tra that train of artillery. And you can see his uh, diary here. He says, it consists of iron, nine 18-pounders. Now, that was how they designated cannon back in the 18th century. An 18-pounder cannon was a cannon that could fire a ball that weighed 18 pounds. Uh, an average-sized cannon was maybe a six-pounder. So an 18-pounder was really deadly. Uh, smaller than that, uh, you could maneuver them around more easily, so they were better on the battlefield. They might be called field pieces. Larger cannon uh, would be used, especially in siege warfare, uh, when you're trying to uh, uh, attack an entrenched or fortified position, which was exactly what the Continental Army was trying to do at the time, trying to get into Boston. So, Adam said it consisted of 
iron, nine eighteen pounders, ten twelves, six six four nine pounders, then three thirteen inch mortars, two ten inch mortars, one eight inch and one six and a half, and a howitzer, one eight and a half inch and one eight. Uh, mortars were designed to fire explosive shells in an arc that went into a fortified area and then exploded and hopefully did a lot of damage in there. And the howitzer was a particular type of mortar. And then Adams turned to the brass cannon, Bra pound for pound. Brass was stronger than iron uh, and it uh, was safer. So brass cannon were more valuable, uh, but it was also more rare. Brass cannon, he wrote, eight three-pounders, one four-pounder, two six-pounders, one eighteen-pounder, one twenty-four-pounder, one eight-and-a-half-inch mortar, one seven-and-a-half-inch ditto, and five cohorts. Cohorns was another term for a mortar. All in all, John Adams counted 58 pieces of artillery in Framingham on January 26th. Framingham thus plays a role in one of the most popular stories of the Revolutionary War. And I drove by this, this very plaque as I came here this evening. Here are some examples of books retelling Henry Knox's story for different audiences. Uh, and on the, uh, the lower right, that's a Viewmaster slide, if you remember Viewmasters. So you may have heard this story already uh, about how General George Washington sent the young bookseller Henry Knox out to Fort Ticonderoga to bring back cannon for the American army, and how Knox struggled with over the wintry mountains with ox teams loaded down with the heavy guns. And as Washington planned, that artillery forced the British army out of Boston in March 1776. That's the standard story. As usual, the full story is a little more complicated. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. The complications, the secrets, the arguments, the mysteries. The size of the story that we don't usually hear about. Uh, I'll start with the fact that in 1871, Horatio Beeman's biographies of 250 distinguished men said this about Henry Knox. When young Knox presented himself at Washington's headquarters, our army was destitute of cannon. They had no cannon. The belief that the Continental Army had no artillery until Knox pops up a lot. In, in fact, the Massachusetts Patriots had started to collect cannon in September 1774, seven months before the war began, and that's the topic of my book, The Road to Concord. Uh, they hauled, people hauled cannon out of batteries that uh, guarded uh, the towns of, like Charlestown and Salem along the shores. They bought cannon from merchants who had used them to guard their, arm their ships. They even stole four small brass cannon out of armories in Boston under Redcoat Guard and smuggled them out of the city. All those stories are in my book. For now, I'll just say that in April 1775, James Warren wrote to his wife, Mercy, Mercy Otis Warren, from Concord, this town is full of cannon. <laughs> Warren expected the British commander, General Thomas Gage, to want those guns, to come for those guns. And indeed, that's why General Gage sent troops out to Concord. So Massachusetts, not only did they have cannon at the beginning of the war, they had enough cannon to start the war, is my argument. That's not to say that all those cannon were big or in good condition or fully equipped, but they had cannon. And over the course of 1775, Massachusetts gained some more cannon. A company came up from artillery from Rhode Island with four excellent field pieces, according to the newspapers. In late uh, May, the uh, provincials captured at least two small cannon off a Royal Navy ship that ran aground off Chelsea. And in November, this handsome man, Captain John Manley, captured a British supply ship that was carrying, among other things, a, thir a mortar 13 inches across. That was such a big mouth that the army just had to call it, nickname it, the, con the Congress. <laughs> now, of course, all those artillery pieces, they lost a few as well. They lost five at the Battle of Bunker Hill to the British. But in any case, they had a lot of cannon. And furthermore, they had some pretty big cannon. Uh, here's an entry from the Journal of Private Samuel Bixby, who was stationed at Roxbury. January, July 1st, 1775, Saturday. We are making it strong as possible all around the fort. We have two 24-pound cannon and 40 balls to each. We finished one platform and placed the cannon on it and just at night and then fired two balls into Boston. 
And General William Heath also recorded those same shots from those 24-pounder cannons. And later Bixby mentioned that it are 18-pounders. So they, they had some, a few big siege guns. But, of course, an army never thinks it has enough. And that's what General Henry Knox was all about. Uh, how many did they have? Well, we have the report from Colonel Richard Gridley, who was in charge of the artillery for the whole siege uh, in 1775. And October, on October 20th, after a lot of prodding from General Washington, he finally submitted an inventory that listed all the ordnance shot and shells now in camp. Five 24-pounders, six 18-pounders, two 12-pounders, three 9-pounders, one 8-pounder, two 6-pounders, four 5-and-a-quarter-pounders, seven four-pounders, nine three-pounders, and two two-and-a-half-pounders. 41 cannon in all, plus nearly 9,000 cannonballs, 10 mortars, and over 1,000 mortar shells. So uh, while Knox brought back more cannon, in fact, he doubled the number, those weren't the first cannon that the army had. Another common myth is that Henry Knox was the one who came up with the idea of bringing cannon back from Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, some biographers even say that he, uh, that other people dismissed the idea and made fun of it. Uh, and in fact, many people had had that idea. It was a long journey, no question, but other people had had the idea at first. In fact, back on May 3rd, the head of the Massachusetts Committee of Safety wrote out orders for an aggressive officer from Connecticut who wanted to go west and take Fort Ticonderoga and other British Army sites along Lake Champlain. And those orders specified that that officer was to, quote, take possession of the cannon, mortar, stores, and of others upon the lake, and bring back with you such of the cannons, mortar, stores, etc., as you shall judge may be serviceable to the army here. Now, the head of that committee of safety was Dr. Benjamin Church, Jr., and the Connecticut officer was Colonel Benedict Arnold, and both of those men later proved to be traitors to the American cause, so we don't want to give them credit for the idea. But nevertheless, the idea of bringing cannon back from, Lake Ticonderoga, from Fort Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain was there from the very beginning. Nobody got around to doing that for two reasons. One is they had a lot to do around Boston, and it was a big job. The other is that in, uh, starting in the fall, the Americans decided gradually uh, to invade Canada. And so the people, the New York troops who were going to go up to Canada, everybody thought they should have first dibs on those guns. And it wasn't until they left that what was left behind was seen as fair to bring to Boston. On October 23rd, General Washington had a conference at his headquarters in Cambridge to make plans for the coming months. And this is the headquarters in Cambridge. One of the agenda items was artillery of different kinds will be, will be wanted. How is it to be got and where? And the men at the conference, generals and delegates from the Continental Congress, agreed that what can be spared from New York and Crown Point be procured. So Knox's mission to bring back the cannon wasn't one young man's crazy idea. It was policy. It was what the army was looking about all along. The question was who was the best man for the job? Another common statement in Knox biographers is that Knox had experience with artillery before the war. Uh, people say that he trained with a militia company in Boston that was uh, called the Train, and it was uh, all about using artillery. And that's possible. Knox certainly, when he became 60, age 16, he had by law to train with some artillery company. But we don't have records of artillery companies to show who was training with them, for the most part, in peacetime. Uh, what we do know is that in the spring of 1772, Knox helped to co-found a totally different militia company with this man, uh, Joseph Pierce, the Boston Grenadier Corps. Grenadiers were a type of infantry, a sort of elite uh, soldier. Uh, they were usually bigger than the average soldier at the time, which certainly Henry Knox was. Uh, in New England, the New England militia, the men, uh, the enlisted men, elected their officers up to the rank of sergeant, uh, sergeant, uh, lieutenants, and captains. So when they made Joseph Pierce the captain and then Henry Knox the lieutenant, that was showing the men were showing respect for these men. They were willing to serve under these officers. That in turn showed, gave uh, 
Henry Knox a chance to rise in society. If you were a militia officer, you were being treated with respect. You were being uh, given an opportunity to show leadership, which offered you the chance maybe to run for a political office. It gave you good business connections. So by becoming a lieutenant, Henry Knox, who was a fatherless bookseller, was actually starting to make something of himself in Boston society. It, being a militia officer was a good way to make yourself prominent, and it worked. In 1773, Henry was parading in his militia uniform on training day, and a young woman named Lucy, Fl Lucy Fluker saw him and asked, who was that big handsome man? <laughs> now, Lucy Fluker's father was Thomas Fluker, a wealthy and established merchant. Henry Knox was not established yet in uh, Boston society. He was in a sort of borderline position at this time. Uh, as a bookbinder, he still worked with his hands. He was a mechanic. He was middling class. But as a bookseller, he was also selling to the upper class, to the genteel ranks. So he could gain good manners and knowledge, and he could impress people. Uh, he had only a few years of schooling, but he could uh, educate himself through his reading. In the previous generation, Thomas Hancock had moved, had started as a bookseller and become one of the richest merchants in Boston society. So Henry Knox had a possibility of rising. And no better way to rise than to marry a rich man's daughter. <laughs> However, Thomas Fluker was a su supporter of the royal government. He, not, he, he was not one of the Whigs who were protesting the new taxes from London. And in fact, in 1774, the year after Henry met Lucy, Thomas Flicker became the provincial secretary, which is the third highest ranking royal appointee, which brings us to the question of Henry Knox's politics. A lot of authors say that Henry Knox was a stout and prominent Whig before the war, but his name doesn't appear on any lists of Whig activists from that time. He didn't dine with the Sons of Liberty. He didn't sign petitions. He wasn't active in town meeting or the political caucuses. Now, that might be because he was still very young in the early 1770s. He was, that was still, he was in his early 20s. Uh, but when we do spot him in uh, political situations, he was not a very prominent, outspoken Whig. In 1770, he was on the scene of the Boston Massacre, and he warned the, warned the British Army captain that he didn't have orders to fire. And the attorneys prosecuting that captain called Henry Knox as a prosecution witness, somebody who was going to uh, help uh, convict this British officer. Except that Knox's testimony turned out to be so helpful to the captain that not only was the captain acquitted, but at the next trial of the soldiers at the Boston Massacre, the defense attorneys called Henry Knox as a witness. Uh, I think, really, if you look at his record in the early 1770s, you can, he is really a neutral looking out for business, or at least, at, at most, a moderate Whig. And then he married Thomas Flicker's daughter. So he was married into a loyalist family. And that marriage took place just six months after the Boston Tea Party, two months after the second Boston Tea Party, uh, and incidentally, incidentally, nobody ever said Knox was part of that Tea Party. Um, and one month after the wedding, a New Yorker named James Rivington sent Henry Knox four chests of tea to sell out of his store. <laughs> now, the people, crowds were attacking men in the countryside for having any tea to sell. But Rivington thought, hmm, Henry Knox, Thomas Flicker's new son-in-law, he'll sell tea, won't he? In the 18th century, that's the way mercantile networks worked. The basis was the family network. And why would a bookseller, a young bookseller without any other connections, turn down all the opportunities that his new family provided? But Rivington, Nick Knox wrote back to Rivington to say that he couldn't sell any tea in Boston, at least not openly. But as late as February 6, 1775, Knox was reporting to Rivington, one chest I sold to my particular friends at a rate of 12 shillings sterling per pound, but I've not been able to sell more, one ounce to any other person. So instead of being a prominent, outspoken Whig before the war, Henry Knox was playing a balancing game. Rivington
Pennington also promised to recommend Knox's store to officers of the 23rd Regiment who were being moved from New York to Boston as the London government sent more troops into Boston in the spring of 1774. And scholars and witnesses agree that Knox's bookstore became a popular hangout for army officers and young ladies. After all, if you can't trust the son-in-law of the province secretary, who can you trust? And that arrangement was useful, not just to Knox. On January 3rd, 1775, Josiah Quincy Sr. of Braintree wrote to his son with some sensitive news. Quote, Mr. W. brings intelligence from Boston that one of the Navy officers meeting with a land officer at K slash X's shop Ooh, so secret, K slash X's shop, <laughs> told him that on board all the ships their men were grown uneasy and tumultuous, that it was with great difficulty they could govern them, upon which the land officer observed that all the uneasiness among the soldiers was full as great, if not greater, than among the sailors. So Knox's seamen, and probably Knox himself, was a source of sensitive information for the Whigs, like Josiah Quincy. In fact, Knox could well have been a source of extremely valuable information. In 1798, Paul Revere recalled, in the, winter, in the fall of 1774 and winter of 1775, I was upwards of 30 chiefly mechanics who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movements of the British soldiers. We held our meetings at the Green Dragon Tavern. We were so careful that our meetings should be kept secret that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that they would not discover reveal any of our transactions. About November, when things began to grow serious, a gentleman who had connections with the Tory party but was a Whig at heart acquainted me that our meetings were discovered, then mentioned the identical words that were spoken among the, us the night before. We removed to another place which we thought was more secure, but here we found that all our transactions were communicated to Governor Gage. This came to me through the then Secretary Fluker. He told it to the gentleman mentioned above. So who was this gentleman who had connections with the Tory party but was a Whig at heart? Who had connections specifically with Secretary Fluker? Wh whose name still had to be kept secret 24 years later, perhaps because he was betraying his own family? Several historians have concluded that the most likely suspect was Henry Knox. And Henry, Thomas Fluker would have been much more likely to speak in front of Henry Knox if he didn't think his son-in-law was a Whig, if he thought he could still trust, uh, if he thought he, Henry was still a loyalist or at least neutral or ripe for conversion. And I posit that that was, that most people up until the beginning of the war, most people had no idea which way Knox would jump. But in mid April 1775, the war did come. Knox's biographers have been very unclear about when he left town and how. And uh, I found new information in, of all places, a mercantile magazine from 1849, which contained an obituary of a descendant of Joseph Pierce. Now, do you remember the name of Joseph Pierce? He was the son of, he was the man who founded the Grenadier Company. So he and Knox had worked together very closely for several years. And the Pierce family had preserved this tradition. Knox had some difficulty in escaping from Boston, but he was enabled to do it through a permit obtained by Mr. Pierce for Shez to pass the lines at Boston Neck. As he took leave of the future general, the latter remarked, my sword blade is thrust through the cushions on which we sit and Lucy has her, the hilt in her pocket. So they did sneak out of Boston, and they snuck the sword out, but Lucy wasn't wearing it. It was in the custom. And when did this happen? Well, on May 14, 1775, the Boston minister Samuel Cooper wrote in his diary that we dined at Mr. Emerson's in Concord with Mr. Knox and wife of Boston. So it appears that the Knoxes were out of Boston and heading west by May 14th. So that's a little bit less than a month after the war began. By early July, we know that Lucy was in Worcester and Henry was at Roxbury. At that point, Henry was not yet officially with the Massachusetts Army. He was a gentleman volunteer, meaning that he was helping out. But a big part of that label, gentleman volunteer, was gentleman. He wasn't just going to sign up 
to be an enlisted man. He was officer's material, but there were no openings in the, minist- in the uh, provincial army because it had already been organized around uh, small towns. So Henry was helping out to building the large fort here in Roxbury. And as you can see from this period map, before Boston was changed, or greatly transformed by landfills, uh, there was just a very narrow neck of land between Boston and the rest of Massachusetts. And the town at the bottom of that neck was Roxbury. So you had to protect that uh, neck of land. You had to make sure that there were no thousands of British soldiers marching down there. Uh, the, right away, the uh, provincial started to fortify the hill in Roxbury to command that area, and Henry Knox became involved in that effort. Early on the morning of July 6th, Henry wrote to Lucy out in Worcester, and he was living then at Captain Lemuel Child's house in Roxbury, and the previous day he was excited to report his work had caught the eyes of two very important men. General George Washington the newly arrived commander of the army, sent by the Continental Congress, and General Charles Lee, the new third in command, an Englishman with extensive military experience. Henry wrote, yesterday, as I was going to Cambridge, I met the generals who begged me to return to Roxbury again, which I did. When they had viewed the works, they expressed the greatest pleasure and surprise at their situation and apparent utility, to say nothing of the plan, which did not escape their praise. So now, if you look at the other things that Washington and Lee were writing at this time about the fortifications they found around Boston, they didn't like much. So if Henry was accurate, they were really very impressed by this young man. On August 8th, General Washington invited Henry Knox to dine at his headquarters. On September 25th, he invited Henry and Lucy Knox to dine at the headquarters. This was the beginning of a mentor-protege relationship with Washington that lasted 20 years. But at this point, Henry Knox still wasn't even in the army. Now, around this time, Washington was starting to look to shake up his artillery regiment. They were the men who were both in charge of the fortifications, those uh, uh, which he had been finding inadequate, and in charge of the cannons and the mortars that were supposed to fire into Boston. The Massachusetts government had appointed a man named Richard Gridley to command that uh, regiment. Gridley was very respected for his part in the seizure of Fort Lewisburg here in 1745, and he actually created this map for this campaign. Uh, He had also served in the French and Indian War. He was about 20 years older than Washington. Massachusetts people thought that he was a military genius, and he was no longer up to the job. During the Battle of Bunker Hill, Colonel Gridley had behaved bravely, but the fortifications were pretty mediocre, and he had been wounded in the fight. So that meant he had to stay home in Stoughton to recover, sending orders to the front line through his son, Scarborough Gridley, whom he had insisted that the army make into a major, uh, just because it, Scarborough was his son. And Scarborough had truly disgraced himself at, during Bunker Hill. In fact, in this picture of Bunker Hill, uh, he's down here. The fighting is all over here. <laughs> he's here. He hasn't even gone on to the, the Charlestown Peninsula, and he is listed in the uh, key as broke officer which means he was fired for doing this at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And yet he was the man who was providing the orders, carrying the orders from Colonel Gridley into the rest of the army. This uh, was simply untenable as a situation. And in, uh, one Massachusetts general, John Thomas, confidentially told John Adams that fall, Colonel Gridley, so famed, I think falls much short of my expectations and appears now to be superannuated. And Washington wrote to the governor of Connecticut about needing military engineers, and he lamented how exceedingly deficient the army is of gentlemen skilled in that branch of business, and that most of the works which have been thrown up for our defense of our several encampments have been planned by a few of the principal officers of the army, assisted by Mr. Knox, a gentleman of Worcester. So already Washington had his eye on Knox. And it is possible, I suggest, that people respected Knox not just because he drew a really nice fort in Roxbury, but because they knew what he had been doing before the war when he was providing information. 
And they knew how much he had given up by leaving behind his wife's family and Boston to come out and take his chances with the Patriots. Whatever was the reason, on October 23rd, at headquarters, General Washington presided over a conference, and he brought up two points relating to the artillery command. Very unhappy disputes prevailed in the regiment of artillery. Colonel Gridley has become very obnoxious to that corps, and the general is informed that he will prove to the destruction of the regiment if continued therein. What is to be done in this case? And the meeting agreed that as all officers must be appoint, approved by the general, if it shall appear that in forming the new army, starting in 1776, that the difference is irreconcilable, Colonel Gridley be dismissed in some honorable way. And then another question was, engineers are also must wanted. Where can they be got? Agreed to recommend to the Congress Henry Knox Esquire and Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Putnam, who have skill in that branch as assistant engineers with suitable pay and rank as lieutenant colonels. So at the age of 25, Henry Knox was going to jump from being a gentleman volunteer to a lieutenant colonel and assistant engineer in the Continental Army. And he turned that down. As he didn't think the rank was high enough. And he explained to John Adams, a number of the generals desired me to act as engineer and said that when the delegates from the Continental Congress came here, the matter should be settled. Myself as chief engineer with the rank and pay of colonel. But of the three Continental Congress delegates who had come to talk with General Washington, only Benjamin Franklin supported that plan, and the other two voted it down. So they had come up with a compromise. Knox felt disrespected. As all honor is comparative, I humbly hope that I have as good pretensions to the rank of colonel as many now in the service. The declining to confer which by the delegates not a little surprised me. If your respectable body should not incline to give the rank and pay of colonel, I must beg to decline it. Not but I will do every service in my power as a volunteer. But George Washington, General Washington, he knew what man he wanted. And on November 8, he threw the weight of the military establishment behind the idea of appointing Knox as the new artillery commander. The council of officers are of unanimously of opinion that the command of the artillery should can no longer continue in Colonel Gridley, and knowing no person better to qualify to supply his place or whose appointment will give more general satisfaction, have taken the liberty of recommending Henry Knox Esquire to the consideration of the Congress. Nine days later, the Congress had acted on that recommendation and commissioned Knox. Washington had already given Knox orders for his first mission. He was not waiting around. On November 16th, Washington told Knox, you are to proceed with the most expeditious, in the most expeditious manner to New York. There apply to the president of the provincial congress of that colony for permission to get the cannon. Then you must go up to Major General Philip Schuyler at Albany and get the remainder from Ticonderoga, Quebec, Crown Point, or St. John's, if it should be necessary, from Quebec. And if, if, if in our hands, the want of them is so great that no trouble or expense must be spared to obtain them. Now, this was a heavy mission. It required political skill to deal with the New York legislature and General Schuyler, especially since Knox didn't have an official commission, and he's still only in his mid-20s. It required the knowledge of artillery to pick out which guns would be most useful and what equipment was needed. And it required, most of all, the logistical talent to be able to organize gathering all those cannon and moving them hundreds of miles across a sometimes mountainous and very sparsely settled landscape. But Knox was, felt he was up to the job, and he went off to New York, and he went up to Albany, and he was ready to go. Now, we often talk about Knox bringing back cannon from Fort Ticonderoga. This is Fort Ty. It was greatly restored in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It's now a wonderful museum with vibrant programming, so it gets all the press. But there's also Crown Point, which is off, it's on the lower end of uh, Lake Champlain. It's in ruins. It's very picturesque ruins, I think. It's actually quite lovely in the summer. But we know from the uh, papers of General Schuyler and of Colonel Knox that there were cannon at both places. 
and at Fort George and at some landing points on Lake George. And it doesn't seem possible to sort out exactly where Henry Knox gathered his cannon. But no one site had all the cannon that they needed. And the people at who, the friends of, Fort, of Crown Point, would be are really glad if we start saying he brought cannon from Fort Ticonderoga and the Crown Point. <laughs> Eventually, Colonel Knox chose 59 pieces of artillery, 43 cannon, and 16 mortars of different sorts, plus one barrel of flints and 23 boxes of lead. We don't have any pictures of Knox's train of artillery made in 1776, but we have a lot of pictures made in the late 1800s and later, and they all show oxen. Just lots and lots of pictures of oxen pulling guns. Here's that Viewmaster thing again. <laughs> and indeed, in December, ox teams pulled the sleds from the fort at Ticonderoga to the north landing of Lake George. So, here's the fort down to Lake George, then they were put on uh, boats and floated down the lake because it was even more efficient to put things, uh, carry things by water. But then, at the bottom of Lake George, General Schuyler wasn't able to hire enough ox teams at the prices that he wanted. Instead, he sent out his wagon master and other people to all parts of the country to immediately send up their sleighs and horses. So for the rest of the, of the journey, all the way down over to, into Massachusetts, horses did the pulling. But we don't have any pictures of horses pulling. <laughs> Knox added two teams of oxen to drag the heaviest cannon across over the Berkshires, but on January 13th, he went back to horses, saying they will be able to travel much, much farther than oxen. Another thing that we see in all those pictures is the snow. Pushing through the snow. Part of the legend of Knox's journey is the rough weather. The cold and the snow were just tremendous obstacles that made, it makes the journey even more, even harder and therefore even more impressive. But winter was when New Englanders had learned to move heavy objects like logs. Because if the road was hard frozen, that was better than a muddy road. If the roads were hard frozen and covered with a packed ice or snow, you could put a sled on that and just slide it. And in fact, that was what Knox had in mind. On December 5th, he wrote Washington, the conveyance from hence will depend entirely on the sledding. If that is good, they shall immediately move forward. Without sledding, the roads are so much gully that it will be impossible to move a step. And snow finally came around Christmas time, an exceeding fine snow. And it was too much at first, and Knox wrote about traveling ahead that day. We got a sleigh to go to Albany, but the roads not being broken prevented our going getting further than about five, nine miles above Albany. The horses tired and refused to go any further. I was then obliged to undertake a very fatiguing march of two miles in snow three feet deep through the woods, there being no beaten path. Even though Knox described himself that night as almost perished from the cold, he actually wanted cold. He wanted more cold. He wanted the Hudson River to freeze solidly so he could slide the guns over the ice. And in early January 1776, he was employed in getting holes cut in the different crossing places in the river to strengthen the ice. You let more water up and get to the air and it could freeze over. On January 4th, a cannon fell through the ice at the river at Half Moon Ferry. And the next day, Knox complained to Washington from Albany, a cruel thaw hinders from crossing Hudson River. The first severe night will make the ice on the river sufficiently strong. Till that happens, the cannon and mortars must remain where they are. Knox started off again on January 7th, and a bigger gun fell into the river. But he's able to get that out with the help of people from Albany, and he, they named it the Albany. Uh, for four days later, he got, finally got the lead. He caught up to the lead teams that were stopped in Blandford, Massachusetts, because the Teamsters refused going any further on account there was no snow beyond five or six miles further. And once again, Knox really wanted snow. He wanted cold. He wanted the harsh weather. So yes, sometimes the weather was an obstacle. At other times, the weather was uh, the way that this journey was made possible. Uh, I mentioned a couple of cannon that were lost in the river. One, Knox got back up. Another stayed under. He never got it back. That's why he started with 59 guns and ended with 58 when he got to Framingham. 
Uh, in the 1850s, an iron six-pounder cannon with a royal monogram of it was dredged out of the Mohawk River. And this was displayed and paraded around for, I think, the next century as Knox's lost cannon. It was on display at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, somehow, in the water, it had shrunk from an 18-pounder to a six-pounder. <laughs> so it's no longer on display. <laughs> uh, Knox, it is said, arrived back in Cambridge on January 24th. Now, we don't know that from his own diary, because he stopped keeping his diary on January 11th. But this man, William Heath, uh, uh, wrote on just January 18th, Colonel Knox of the artillery came to camp. He brought from Ticonderoga a fine train of artillery which had been taken from the British, both cannons and mortars, which were ordered to be stopped at Framingham. So on January 18th, Knox was in Cambridge, but all the guns were out here in Framingham. It seems likely that Knox had gone ahead to report to General Washington and confer about what to do with this new artillery. Uh, so why, if he was, if he got to Cambridge on the 18th and the cannon were still back here, why do they say January 24th? Well, the first person who ever wrote a biography of, Jan of Henry Knox said January 24th, and everybody has followed that since, as far as I can tell. When Knox got to Cambridge, his commission, his official commission, all nicely written out, as Colonel of the Artillery Regiment was waiting for him. And we can tell exactly when he took command because of an orderly book that I found at the uh, Anderson House Library of the Society of the Cincinnati in Washington, D.C. Orderly books are records kept of all the orders that come down from the generals and in each regiment from the colonels. And on January 28th, after a long spell of very little activity, this orderly book from the artillery regiment just starts filling up with orders from General Knox, from Colonel Knox. And he's just very enthusiastic, and he has all these ideas about how the army should run as a well-timed machine and things like that. So we can tell on January 28th, he was in charge. Uh, on January 22nd, incidentally, uh, the password, there was a pair of passwords issued every year by the army for the sentries to use as signs and countersigns. And on January 22nd, one of the Continental Army passwords was Framingham. So General Washington was thinking about this town. In fact, we should even think about whether, as people, as lots of people have written, Cambridge was where Colonel Knox was headed with his cannon. Because if we look at this map of the roads through Massachusetts, the road forks out here in Marlborough. And this is the road that goes through Concord and Lexington and Monotony, Arlington, into Cambridge. But to get to Framingham, you turn right. So they had gone some miles off the road to Cambridge when those guns were in this town. I'm not sure why Knox did that. That's one of the things I want to find out. It, one possibility is that he's actually aiming to deliver all the cannon to Roxbury, where he knew, uh, or uh, possibly even to Dorchester at that point. Um, it may have been that Framingham was a good place to mount those cannon, to get them on wheels, to get all the equipment necessary, to make sure that they were in good working order. Perhaps that there was, this town had a, uh, a good set of blacksmiths and was far enough from the front lines to do this sort of work. It, it does appear that uh, they didn't just pass by here. They were here for nearly a month. Uh, Ezekiel Price, a Boston official who was living out in uh, um, Stoughton, wrote in his diary on February 26th, this is a full month after John Adams looked at the cannon, it is said that the heavy cannon which were left at Framingham are brought down to Cambridge. The mortars are fixed on their new beds. The fort at Leechmere's Point is nearly finished. Fascines going constantly to Dorchester, everything in readiness to make a push by our army. And that was, this was the final, this was the end game of the siege of Boston. Again, the standard story is that all those cannon that uh, Henry Knox brought went up on Dorchester Heights. Uh, Dorchester at this time, again, before landfills, it had this peninsula sticking out into Boston Harbor. And one part of it was especially high, called Dorchester Heights. On February 11th, Washington, Knox, and other officers went out on that peninsula to uh, survey the scene. 
Rufus Putnam, the Continental Engineer who is now working under Knox, he had this brainstorm which allowed the Continental Army to prefabricate some fortifications to move out there because the ground was too uh, hard, to, to still too frozen hard to dig. But if they moved uh, uh, fortifications, wooden fortifications out there, they could get enough protection to be able to dig over time. Knox was closely involved in planning and the logistics for that operation. An artillerist named Solomon Nash stated in his journal, quote, we carried, 12, uh, we carried six 12-pounders on the Dorchester Heights. Back in October, Colonel Gridley had counted only two 12-pounders in his force. So at least four of those six 12-pounders were guns that Knox had brought back from Lake Champlain. So some guns definitely went up onto Dorchester Heights. But the other cannon and mortar were deployed in many places around the siege lines at uh, Leachmere's Point and Cobble Hill and at Lamb's Dam and the fort in, King in Roxbury, as well as out on Dorchester Heights. Because the plan that the Continental Army had come up with involved firing from all these places into Boston starting in the early March 1776. Uh, and that artillery fact, fire was distracting the British defenders and covering up the noise that uh, was made on March 4th as the Continental Army moved its equipment and its men along this road onto Dorchester Heights. On March 5th, the British commanders discovered the Americans had built this new fortification uh, when they woke up in the morning, and they knew that their ships which were their lifeline and escape route out of Boston, were now in danger from firing of cannon on that high ground. Now, many officers say that those cannon drove the British out of Boston. They made the British decide to leave. And in a way, that's true. Within two weeks of seeing those cannon up on that height, the, the British evacuated Boston. But in another way, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Because the British commander, General William Howe, he had decided to leave back in July. The Battle of Bunker Hill had convinced him there was no reason to stay, that these people in Boston and Massachusetts were zealots. They were crazies. There was no way that you would ever beat them or pacify them. You might as well leave, start in New York, start over, cut them off. Howe had presented that plan to London, but the plan had to go across. And then the ministers in London had to consider it. And then they had to approve it. And then they had to send their approval back across. And by the time Hal got approval for his plan, it was so late in the year that he decided he couldn't uh, collect enough ships to evacuate Boston uh, safely. So he decided to stay over the winter. And all that time, all that winter of 1775, 76, Hal was just waiting it out. But out in Cambridge, Washington was worried that the British at any moment would come crashing out through the siege lines and destroy his army, his dwindling army. And he worried that the Congress would want him to attack Boston and he didn't have enough people and he kept coming up with plans to attack Boston and his other generals kept saying, mm, no. Uh, but the British didn't need an all-out attack to evacuate Boston. They just needed a sharp nudge. And Colonel Knox, with his cannon, deployed around Boston and including up on Dorchester Heights, he provided that nudge. And on March 17th, 1776, the British left Boston and uh, almost immediately Washington told his new colonel of artillery, okay, start moving your guns down to New York because we've got the rest of the war to win. And that was Henry Knox's second mission. Thank you. I would be happy to uh, take any questions uh, for a couple of minutes before we break for refreshments. Is there any truth to the story that Knox learned about artillery from books in his bookstore? And that he was the only person that, that uh, Washington could rely on to do anything about? Um, is there any question, is there any truth that Knox learned all about artillery in the bookstore? Um, probably he did. Uh, we don't know for certain. We do know that. Um, there was one book that he borrowed from 
uh, the third in command of the artillery regiment, a man named uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Mason, who had been heavily involved in gathering cannon before the war. He's a big part of this book. Um, and that book from Colonel Mason remains with Henry Knox's books now at uh, the Athenaeum. So he never gave it back. Uh, um, another book that was used, uh, the book where Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Putnam found this idea which allowed the prefabricated fortifications for Dorchester Heights, well, that book was borrowed from William Heath. So there were other people who had books of artillery uh, information. Knox wasn't the only one. But I'm quite certain that he did do a lot of reading at that time. Now, I, I think that Knox's, um, his strength as an officer, an, art, an artillery officer, was not gunnery. He wasn't the best gunner uh, in, the, in his regiment. And I'm not sure he was the best engineer and uh, knew the most about fortification. I think his strength was logistics and working with people. And he could figure out how to do this very complex operation like bringing the cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, or like overseeing this whole wing of the American army. And eventually, Knox was Secretary of War, so overseeing the entire American military, that was his strength. And people loved him. People really liked working with him, especially Washington. So that was another very strong point in his favor. Yes? What happened to his in-laws? When the British left, in March 1776, the Flookers left as well. Thomas, his wife, his younger daughter, his older illegitimate daughter who was living with the family, his son who was a British officer, they all moved to Britain, and Lucy never saw them again. Uh, Lucy did inherit from her mother a great deal of land in Maine, which eventually became Knox's estate. And he spent the 1790s and early 1800s managing this large tract of land and trying to do what Washington did of, of uh, being the benevolent landlord for many, many people. And it didn't work out that well. But uh, that was the, uh, the ultimate inheritance that the Knoxes got from her family. Yes, sir. Where were the cannons manufactured? Until this, until the war began, there was there were no uh, cannon manufactories in the uh, in America. They all had to come from Europe. But there was, I think, there's one guy out in Stoughton who was trying it. But you really, I mean, those things you're loading them up with gunpowder and, and setting fire to it. So you really need them to be well made. <laughs> um, they were. They were primarily coming from Britain, but they would also, many of them were old French guns that had been captured in the previous wars. There were a lot more cannon around than we would think, uh, considering that they were such advanced military weapons. But if you were a merchant and uh, you often would want to have a few cannon for your ship, just in case, you know, France and Britain are going to war again for the third time this century, I want to make sure that my ship is not captured by the French privateers or navy, so I'll put a couple of cannon on it. Um, so like, there was a man named Thomas Henderson Peck in Boston, a hatter, who had a cannon in his basement, just because he had no place else to put it. Um, just yesterday, I heard from a, an email from a woman in Lunenburg. Uh, Lunenburg was talking in 1775 about what to do with their nine-pounder cannon, and should they spend money to uh, get it ready for war. So there were cannon all over the place. Uh, and it just, um, uh, which also probably meant that a lot of men knew how to work cannon. At least they had done it once or something. I mean, it, because they had, had done it either in the militia or maybe while they were sailors during the war. So the, the knowledge was out there as well. Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned a lot of this. Now, uh, monuments are strung. Uh, is it 26 or 31? How many of them? I think I think it's 31. They, there was uh, there was a change. So they were they were revived. Leads with one in South Row, one in Framingham. There's two in Wayland. Are uh, all these, in your opinion, a bit in terms of the accuracy of the? Well, they're very. I was noticing they all say the same thing. Yeah. It's a standard uh, 
uh, bronze plaque and then uh, uh, wood, uh, carved words. And they all say that Henry Knox passed by this spot. And probably those are pretty good. I mean, we, we know where the roads were. We know that he had to get from this place to another. And there are places along the way where it said, like Blandford, uh, that we know he had to go through that town. So really, there's only one route to get from Blandford to Framingham. The, the carvings are very carefully, they don't say anything about time, they don't say a date, they don't say uh, that things stopped here, I think they say just that he passed by here. And I think that's accurate as far as it goes. I also think that the one out here could be, you know, the guns didn't just pass by here. They were here for a, yeah. a month. Um, we don't know where. <laughs> we don't know if the plaque is in the, exactly the right place. <laughs> but I would say that uh, the plaques, yeah, we can trust the plaques. There might be other places where the plaques should be as well. But where they are, that seems, that seems pretty solid. Was a question in the back? Um, it's really tough to, to know where things were. Yes, in, in, in Framingham, uh, we know from John Adams that Colonel Buckminster, uh, Joseph Buckminster, um, a militia colonel, and uh, I think he had a tavern, uh, he took them out to look at the cannon. We don't know whether it was like, come out to the backyard, or we're going to take a two-mile walk. <laughs> so, no, I don't know where the cannon were. Um, I'd love to find out. So if anybody has information, uh, uh, the, in, I've been frustrated uh, to f the 18th century armies were not as good as I really wish they were on ex labeling where cannon were at any given point, a specific cannon. Uh, sometimes they're marked, most often they're not. Usually they're just designated by size, sometimes not even that. This is a local war. some blacksmith at times. Um, it's, given the number of cannon, like 58, uh, 43 cannon and, and uh, 15 mortars, that's probably more than one barn's worth, especially if you're trying to, to uh, fit them on, on wheels and things like that, on, on carriages. Uh, so, but that might indeed be uh, old enough. There are certainly, uh, there are legends from Brookline closer to the move on to uh, Dorchester Heights, where they talk about specifically hiding the cannon in barns to make sure that they're not spotted by uh, spies uh, to keep that secret. And that might be another reason why they were kept out here for a while until Washington decided what to do with them. So thank you. Yes? How many of Knox's uh, uh, artillery pieces survived, and where are they? That is another good question, because um, it seems to be like pieces of the True Cross. I think that there might be more than 58 cannon out there said to be Carol Knox's cannon. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, but there are, there are certainly places which claim that they have uh, one or two of the original cannon on display. Looking at how things were at the end of the war, um, uh, I would bet that it's very hard to make any, any proof of there. Uh, the there are two cannon, which I, in this, which I talk about in this book, which I can trace, but only because in 1786, Henry Knox, as Secretary of War, had them engraved with a particular set of words that make them unique. And everything else is just, I mean, literally, they're saying, like General Green, hey, you want a couple of cannon for your new estate in South Carolina? Sure, we'll send you some cannon. <laughs> it, it was uh, the end of the war. They were de accessioning. So at least a couple have been authenticated. Again, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I have not checked the whole provenance all the way back. I'm a little skeptical, but I can certainly say that they, there are claims out there. And so somebody would be able to go to these various places, to Cambridge, and, uh, and see, okay, 
what's the basis of saying that these were Colonel Knox's cannons? I haven't done that yet. <laughs> okay, last question. Maybe. Yes, please. What was the last time that they found the cannon? What was the last time they found a cannon? Uh, from Knox. Uh, related to Knox? Um, I, I don't know. I Well, there was this... How recent? Yes. Um, well, there was this... Uh, uh, from this train... Um, uh, there was this, that one in the 1850s, which they thought they found. Then the others, I don't think, were marked well enough, so it's just a matter of whether they're claimed to be found. There is a revolutionary cannon now in Lake Champlain, I think it is, which uh, they actually decided to leave down in the lake. Uh, it's from the Battle of Valcour Island, I believe, uh, which was a, one of Benedict Arnold's successes on the lake. Um, and uh, they decided to leave it down there because it was the water was so cold that it was actually preserving the gut. But now there's uh, some mussel, the zebra mussel or something, something, which has gotten into the lake. And now they're thinking, okay, now we better haul it up and put it in a climate-controlled environment for a while and then see if we can get the, it, to adjust it and so on. So there is a multi-million dollar campaign going on at this, mount, at this museum up in Lake Champlain to get this cannon back. So, yes, they are still finding cannon for the Revolutionary War. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. I look forward to it.